the topic of today is that of collaborative robots. And I've also added a sentence in the invitation, which says collaborative robots in the range of three to 1300 kilos, with a, which probably raises some questions among few of you. So let's dig deeper into this. What, I, what do I mean? Uh, as you may or may not know, the KUKA offers a wide range of robots, one of the widest ranges of all robot supplies, ranging from small robots of three kilo payload up to really large robots with up to 1300 kilo payload. And we offer also different types of robots. And of course, one of the types of robots that we do offer on the market is collaborative robots. And most of you have probably seen one of these in some one or another way. And in fact, KUKA was one of the absolute earliest suppliers of collaborative robots. And our collaborative robots are called LBR EVA. And EVA is an acronym and stands for Industrial Intelligent Industrial Work Assistant. And what is so special about these, the, our collaborative robots compared to our standard robots? Well, we say it is sensitive robots. That doesn't mean that it has feelings. It does, however, mean that it has force feedback control. It can feel its way forward because it has force feedback uh, sensor in all joints. That means that it can pretty much like a human arm feel its way forward when it's working, thereby searching for objects in the work screen. But of course it can also feel or sense when it collides with something it shouldn't collide with and thereby immediately stop because it has really quick reactions, of course, there. And this is the features that makes it a collaborative robot. It is quite easy to teach and program. It's not the same program system that we have in our other robots, but it has also a way of learning by guiding. It is a very lightweight uh, robot, which makes it easy to move if you want to use it in several different uh, stations. And it actually has seven axes compared to the standard robots, which have, has six axes, which makes it also very, very flexible. And these features I mentioned with this sensing technology makes it, gives it a few possible behaviors which are uh, interesting. We can either travel stubbornly, that means it could push its way forward if, if we want uh, with some force, even though it uh, encounters some resistance, but we can control how much that resistance can be. Uh, and we can also act add functions as and make the robot behave like a spring or a dampening uh, function when it comes to an external uh, force. For example, if a human touches it, it pushes it. And of course, we can also do gravity compensation with it to make it as a lifting device to be able to handle goods easily together with an operator. These are features which makes it collaborative. Uh, in use. And with collaborative, we should pay a little bit attention to the word collaborative because that is working together with the operator, not working next to, but working together with the operator. That means typically that the operator and the robot shares a common task. And in fact, we have two versions of this collaborative robot. The LBR7 and the LBR EVA14. And these figures are regarded to the payload 
of the robots. There, re there is a small, small difference in reach, as you see in this table, but it's almost insignificant. It's only 20 millimeters because the R800 or the R820 is the difference in reach for these robots. And this cobot is also available as an autonomous robot placed on a KMP, which is for the KUKA mobile platform, which makes it possible for this robot to move around in the work environment doing different tasks. And we have had several uh, webinars on the topic of mobile robotics before, so I won't dive into the details around this. And we are also during the next year releasing a completely new generation of collaborative robots, but I think we will get back to that topic on a separate webinar when we get closer to the release of that those robots. What it's very important to remember is that you have to, when you want to use a collaborative robot, regardless of brand, whether it's a KUKA collaborative robot or a collaborative robot of another brand. And what you have to consider when using an HRC cell, a human robot collaboration cell, is that there are no robots from any supplier that are CE marked in itself. The electrical cabinet can be CE marked uh, in terms of meeting the low voltage directives or the EMC demands. Therefore, you sometimes find a CE mark on, for example, the controller cabinet, but the robot itself is never CE marked, regardless of brand. The person or the company doing the integration of the robot, uh, adding a tooling to the robot are always responsible for the C marking and therefore also have to do a risk analysis and so on. And that goes also for the collaborative robots. There is no exception for a robot. The collaborative robot is not safe in itself automatically. The whole cell and the whole application always have to be CE marked. And when we also have to consider that when we are using a collaborative robot, it is a collaborative robot which is done, made specifically for working together with an operator. That means that it can also by accident be stricken by the operator or vice versa strike the operator. And therefore there are pretty big regulations in the speed and thereby the force which we can allow the robot to move with. And basically it is with which energy we are allowed to strike an operator. And the energy of course is depending on both speed but also the payload which means that as the payload goes up, we have to bring down the speed of the robots. So a collaborative robot is typically not suited for a high speed, high productivity environment. And basically we can say actually that there is no such thing as a collaborative robot, uh, but there are of course collaborative applications. And Therefore, it's really important to have a look at your application, your needs, and what stage of collaboration is required, because there are actually several levels of collaboration in robotics. There's been a lot of talk about collaborative robots lately, but what most people don't know is that there's no such thing as a collaborative robot, only collaborative applications. Some may be described as cobots, but if they're handling something or have end-of-arm tooling that can hurt a worker, the application ceases to be collaborative and requires protection. These applications have many benefits, but can also mean slower speeds and lower throughput. 
The key is matching your application to the right stage of human-robot collaboration, and understanding the six stages of HRC is your first step towards getting there. The first stage of human-robot collaboration is the fixed safety fence, and it's the most common. These applications are not safe for direct collaboration and require hard guarding to separate the operator from the robot to eliminate any possible contact. The second stage of human-robot collaboration uses laser or virtual guarding separation within an occasionally shared workspace, such as pallet removal from inside a work cell. These applications feature a safety monitored stop where contact is only possible with a stationary robot. The third stage also features laser or virtual guarding, but the workspace is intended to be shared more often. This includes applications with a lot of manual loading and unloading in the area. Speed and separation monitoring is used to slow the robot when an operator enters the workspace and stop if they get too close. The fourth stage of human-robot collaboration is where the robot and operator share the same workspace with no laser or virtual barrier. Often on assembly lines, these are applications that have robots and operators carry out separate duties next to each other, but contact is neither required nor desired. The fifth stage of human-robot collaboration is what most people generally envision when they hear about collaborative robots. In these applications, the robot and operator must work together collaboratively to complete the process. An example of this would be teach by hand for assembly. These robots move very slow and are force limited for the safety of the operator. The sixth and newest stage, Autonomous Collaborative Robot, combines the advantages of an autonomous ground vehicle with those of a power and force limited robot. This frees the application from what is now considered a fixed event and creates a shared workspace throughout the production environment where both the robot and humans may move simultaneously. From industrial robots to collaborative mobile platforms and IoT, you can be sure that KUKA's unmatched portfolio of products and services can support all of your applications across the six stages of human-robot collaboration. For over 120 years, we've been providing our customers with the innovative ideas and solutions that transform their production processes and enhance their end-users' experiences. Typically, and quite commonly, we get the question from customers that I will have what was in this video described as the fourth level of collaboration. A human and a, a robot working in the same workspace, but they are doing separate tasks. And therefore they are want a collaborative robot. And what we will look into really is that ask the question, can we use a standard robot in that case, or do I have to use a collaborative robot? And I can already now, of course, uh, reveal that no, you can do this with standard robots, and thereby you can use any range of robots, basically. Um, but what this video you saw wanted to say was that it is really important that you look at what your needs is in each application because collaborative robots or not is not a on and off question. It is a bit depending on what you want to do. Uh, it has actually been found that of all the collaborative robots, regardless of brands sold on the market, roughly 15% of those installations actually require the features of a collaborative robots. The other 85% could actually be solved with a standard robot. That means that uh, that is typically the collaboration level of level three or four described in the video before. Uh, and as a cobot typically is more expensive than a standard robot of the same reach and payload class that and is usually more sensitive to environmental condition because it's lightweight it's more plastic or aluminium or whatever usually not uh, shielded electrically shielded in the same way as a industrial robot is and therefore uh, probably suffers a, s a shorter life time than a st industrial robot typical one could say that the industry is 
losing or wasting money on these applications. And that is typically not very popular. And there has been a lot of projections about the global robot markets and the global robot market for collaborative robots. Uh, this is one of these projections we have seen, which has a sharp increase of both industrial robots and collaborative robots. And we are now at 2021, where the estimates, this is a quite an old graph, it was generated at 2015. The estimate was that the growth rate would be that would, there would be globally sold a little bit more than 100,000 collaborative robots. Of course, as we all know, 2020 was a very special year. But already 2019, the estimate at that point was roughly 80,000 collaborative robots. Now, if we look at the AFR actual figures, we can see this, that the total amount of robots sold on the world market is roughly in line with the projections. But the collaborative part of the robots are significantly lower than these estimates. These are actual figures of worldwide sales of collaborative robots, where the red part is collaborative robots. And if we now take into consideration that 80 or 85 percent of those applications could have been done cheaper and simpler with standard robotics. Uh, that raises the question, do we actually find the collaborative applications within the industry or are they outside the industry? We have several customers who are working with collaborative robots together with humans in medical applications, in warehouse handling applications and so on. Perhaps this is the area where the collaborative robots have the greatest use. So going back to collaborative applications, because that is what we learned that we have to look at our applications. We can now use our complete robot portfolio in these applications. And how is that done then? How can I use a standard robot in a coexisting collaborative application. And with coexisting, I mean what was described in the video as level three or level four of these applications. Well, there are actually two ways currently of doing this. We can either actually add additional safety equipment directly on the robot, or we can monitor the space where the robot is working and adapt the robot behavior depending on what happens in that space. So let's have a little short, closer look at these two technologies. And these two technologies are not exclusive. We can, if we like, combine them. And we can also combine them with traditional uh, safety measures as fences on one side or two sides, etc. If we now look at the air skin application, because adding this, there is a possibility to add a safe sensing layer to a robot, which gives the robot a sensitive skin so it can detect a touch, a collision, and thereby immediately stop. And that is available for most of our robots, not the absolute largest ones, but up to a certain level in our range, we can equip and makes the robot do a collision with a human operator in a safe manner, according to the standard TS-15066. That means, but that also means that we need to keep down the speed of the robot, since it's the energy we hit the operator, which is described. And of course, the sensitive skin in itself adds a certain amount of payload to the robot itself. So the work piece cannot be as large as if we did not have this work. But it is a completely safe and good solution in an application where I cannot guarantee that contact with the operators cannot be avoided. The other technology is actually to monitor the robot's workspace and divide it into zones. 
and change the robot behavior depending on what happens in those cells. That is possible by combining a software feature of uh, the robot, which is called safe operation, together with one or several laser scanners that monitors the zone the robot is working in, and hereby creating a safe and coexisting application where the operator and the robot can work in the same space. And how is that then done? Well, this is an example of a laser, uh, robot cell where you have a laser scanner which monitors the workspace, as you see. In this case, we've also combined it with a standard fence on one side of the application. And in this, the operator can walk in and out freely of the robot range. And what happens is that this app technique can be used with any KUKA robot, whether it is a six kilo small robot up to a 1300 kilo palletizing robot. The range and the reach of the, pay of the robot doesn't affect this solution. It affects how wide area we have to monitor, of course, but we can use the same solution regardless of the size of the robots. It allows that we have different, several zones that are monitored and tells the robot to behave in different ways depending on what zones are affected. So in this way, we can create a scenario in this application where, of course, when the operator is completely outside of the zone, the robot works at full speed. When he, I think you see my pointer here, when you get into the outer zone, we start bringing down the speed of the robot in a safe way. So, you, and you can have then bring down the speed of the robot gradually on, uh, as you get closer to the robot to finally, if you get too close to the robot, complete bring the robot to a complete stop in a safe way. So this is one scenario which is quite commonly used for robotic systems today. The other is actually the same technology, but uh, the zone uh, information has been used in a different way. In this case, we have two working zones for the robot. And if an operator is present in, in this case, the zone second zone, the robot is only allowed to work in zone one, here is the active zone. In a safe way, the robot cannot move into the zone where the operator is, Fine. not until the operator leaves that zone. So this technology, it's basically the imagination that stops us at what type of scenarios we can create here. We can have up to 32 different zones handling it uh, uh, with different reaction types of the robots. And this technology, again, can be used with our complete robot range. Thereby, we can actually create collaborative applications with all of our robots, regardless of range and size. Now, we are coming up to the end of this webinar. Before I leave you, I will like to repeat today's most important message. If you are to remember only one thing, it is this. Regardless of which type of collaborative solution you choose, if it's a monitored space application, if it's a collaborative robot, or if we put sensitive equipment on our robot, the same rule applies always. A robot in itself is never ever CM marked, regardless of what robot brand this is. A risk analysis, a CM marking must be done for that application every time. And even if you are using a collaborative robot, there are still risks that need to be addressed when applying them in your production. You have to take care of what additional risk the tooling of the robot uh, brings with it. 
And you have to consider with which speeds the robot are moving, because that is a risk in itself as well. Uh, all this is true of every application, regardless of what type of robot there is and what brand. That is the most important message of this web webinar. With that, I will move over to say that the collaborative robots are really exciting and they are opening up totally new markets with new technology it typically brings new applications. And also here, imagination is the only limitation for us. So I do thank you for your attention. I see I've got a few questions. Let's see if I can answer them. Uh, we got one question that says that uh, asks if the laser scanners recognize the difference between a human operator or any other obstacle placed in a zone, a pallet, parts, handling equipments, etc. Uh, the scanners can tell a difference between a pallet and a person with two legs walking into the zone, uh, thereby telling the difference. That is one aspect of it. Uh, you have to then consider the next risk that if you realize, say, that I am placing in a pallet in the workspace, the scanner will recognize it. But then I have to say, OK, depending on what height the scanner is placed, and if I walk up onto the pallet, perhaps I will have to have an additional scanner to detect that in those cases. So it's possible to do yes, but you have to look through the complete risk scenarios, all the risk scenarios you can imagine using this technology. The next question is what the crowd likes about collaborative robots is the easiness of teaching drag and drop styles. When will it be possible on normal industrial robots? Uh, that is a really good question and I agree. That is one of the main benefits of most uh, collaborative robots. And its work are being done on this topic, both with KUKA and other suppliers. And we have also a lot of partners who are working themselves around these problems by doing tools which automatically generate robot tools. If you see come to our partner event, you will see one such solution. But work is being done. But to be honest, in reality, in an automation cell, even with a standard robot, to make the movements of a robot from point A, picking up the goods at point A and leaving it at point B, that is not really very difficult, even in a standard robot application. The challenge in the robot application is typically signal exchange with exterior uh, equipment, sequence of logic, handshaking with other. That is the more challenging part. To make a simple movement from A to B is, I think you agree, pretty much uncomplicated even with a standard robot. You are welcome to protest, of course, but uh, to just make a movement from A to B is not the difficult part of an automation cell, in my opinion. But I agree. Uh, we have a lot to win to make uh, the robots easier to program and easier to set up, of course. Yes, here we got uh, some collaborative robot suppliers have a more easygoing software, enabling a quicker startup without too many resources. When will it be possible for a KUKA robot to start up in just one hour to begin the application setup? That is, of course, a question of education, but I agree. We are working, and I am personally driving the issue that we should in the first step, improve our documentation with easy step-by-step -step setup uh, of the robot. So you can 
easily and faster get the robot up and running so you can make your first test program. And that is as one part and perhaps the largest part, a matter of documentation, get providing easy startup guides. And there are actually a few available already. And I also mentioned uh, the new generation of uh, collaborative robots that which we're bringing out next year. And together with that, there is a new operating system for the robots coming out, which will actually be exported to all of our standard robots as well over the coming years, not all at once, but gradually. And you can have a look at YouTube. There are videos around it, which is called LBR Easy, where Easy is spelt with two I's. And that is a significant improvement in terms of setting up the robots. But it will come during the next year, so I believe we will have several uh, separate webinars on those topics. Industrial Intelligence